Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I am really excited <laughs> to do this program with you this evening. So we've got a big, big show and a little bit of time. So I'm going to give you all the chips. Yes, yes. Put that put in the comment section. Shout, shout out to your area code, your high school, your hometown, hometown whatever you want to put in that drop down comment section. Number two, if there's some information that you find you through here, please tag a friend, share it, tell them you need to get over here and watch this program. And finally, if you have any questions about anything we talk about tonight, please drop it in the comment section. We will answer your questions because that's what this show is all about. And that's why I'm excited. The show, the show is called What, what to Know from Dr. Dr. Mo. I'm not Dr. Mo. I'm LSD. But you see Dr. Mo here, here on the screen. screen. And this, this show is dedicated to answering, answering all of your health questions. Those health questions that you do not normally ask your doctor that you might be afraid, a little bit embarrassed, or whatever your reasoning is that you don't ask your doctor, that's what this show is about. So please, please, please start answer your ask your questions right now. Put it in the comment section. If you've got a question, any health related question within reason, of course. Okay. Okay. Sometimes you gotta, <laughs> you gotta set some boundaries on some folks. Some of y'all, some of y'all get a little too carried away, but within reason, drop your questions in the comment section, because that's what the show is about. We're not here to teach you anything special, anything new. We're here to ask your questions. That's why it's called what to know from Dr. Mo. But we also have it's Heart Health Month, so we're going to talk a little bit about heart health, and we've got a special, special segment called Cancer Connections, because as Dr. Mo told me, cancer can be connected to any condition, any health condition that we know of, and so she's going to connect at least one condition uh, tonight uh, with our Cancer Connection section. So I think I've done enough talking and filibustering. Let's bring on Dr. Mo. How are you doing, Dr. Mo? Good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm excited to be here with you tonight. How you doing? Well, it's well, always it's fun, fun to be to talk to you. And uh, uh, just, okay, okay. I'm going to let y'all behind the curtain a little bit. Dr. Rose is family like, like myself. myself. So, so that's, that's why, why it is extra, 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 extra special, special to have her here. here. Uh, to I have, have a fellow right here. here. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 questions are coming in. I see you, Demetri. Thank you for joining us. Great question. We're going to get that answer. But first, first, let's get to know Dr. Mo. Y'all may have seen her before. Some of you may have seen her before. She is our uh, expert on our Wednesday Breast Cancer Show. Uh, uh, what? In touch? I don't know. The doctor is in every Wednesday night. This is a crossover event right here with Ricky Fairley. She's the CEO of Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, and we talk all things black breast cancer and survivorship. And so, um, yeah, you'll catch us tomorrow night. We got a great show for you, 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on Black Doctor. But tonight is something something fresh and new and different. So, so uh, first, first question, question is, is um, um, what, inspired what inspired you to you do? do? You know, this, this series, series of gotcha. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I yeah. Gotcha. fantastic. I'm oh, still so with you. Yeah, what inspired me to do this series? And and the answer uh, that I have for you is that the third question every cancer patient asks me. The first one is, "Am I going to die?" The second one is, "Do I need chemo?" And the third question is, "Well, what do I need to know?" to live differently. What can I do? What should I eat? And and we talk a lot about how to have conversations with your doctor because it's not something that anybody teaches you. And I grew up in an era where we didn't talk about two really important things, the most important things. We didn't talk about money and we didn't talk about health. And these are the two most important things that we need to be talking about in the black community. So this idea was born out of that. People need answers. They need trusted advisors. They need places to go. And so here we are. We're bringing it to you, right to your house. Exactly. 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 So, so I'm going to remind you all again, that, that question that you wanted to ask your doctor, doctor. This, this is the show to ask, ask that question. So you can, it's anonymous. Well, I'll, I'll see your name, but I won't call you out of your order. You'll just ask the question. So drop that question in the comment section as we talk to Dr. Mo here. Oh, and her show. I want to know from Dr. Mo. So, um, 
let our viewers, I know some people that watch your show on Wednesday, they know who you are. But let this new group of people know who you are, you know, how do you know how black folks are. We like to know where you came from, who your people are, all that stuff. Let us know a little bit more about Dr. Fantastic. Well, I'm repping the 215. For those of you who are in the know, that's Philadelphia. I'm a Philadelphia native, and I practice breast cancer surgery, and I direct a cancer program just outside of the city of Philadelphia. Um, I am, uh, like you said, I'm, I'm a graduate of the Florida A&M University and uh, went on to do uh, my uh, general surgery at UMass and fellowship at Georgetown and then came here uh, to uh, just outside of Philly to start a cancer program for a community that really needed it. So uh, that's who I am. That's where I'm from. Uh, I come from a family of nurses. My mother was a nurse. My grandmother was a nurse and they both got cancer. And, you know, my mother died at 29 years old of something really rare, ovarian cancer. And we didn't talk about it a lot. And so it, it's it's important for us to have these conversations. And, and I'm here because um, we need answers. And so that's that's what we're going to do. Well, you well, tell you me tell how you want to handle this. Do you want to jump right into some of the questions that are already coming in? Or do you want to talk about our first topic tonight, which is the eight dimensions of wellness? Let's talk about wellness first. And let's set the stage, you know, because the one of the things that people think, you know, is that wellness is, is a destination. It's like you drive and you pull up and you park. And all of a sudden, you're at wellness and everything is zen. And all our food is fresh and clean eating. And, you know, we're doing all the right things. And wellness is not quite like that. It's more like a juggling act where there are eight balls. Believe it or not, there's eight balls in the air. So you're juggling all these things, trying to maintain some balance. So you're trying to maintain some balance, juggling eight different components of wellness. So, well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't juggle, I don't juggle uh, more than three. So I, I was, was, and, and it was funny, funny when, when you told me about the topic, I was like, like eight dimensions of wellness, I had to go look it up. She's absolutely right. That's right. eight dimensions. It was all over. I was trained. I had to put my face up on the ground. But I got it together and figured out what those eight dimensions were. And then, you know, I was like, really? Like, really excited, excited to hear what you had to say about, about it. So, you, you want to start, start with, with which one do you want to start with? with, 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 with can I help us? Are you going to put our graphic up for us? Got our graphic. All right, let's put our graphic up and then we're going to talk about this, okay? So, when we talk about wellness, I need for everybody to understand that there's eight different components and we focus so much on the physical component, right? The the body feeling good, making sure our blood pressure's right, our blood sugars are where they're supposed to be, um, making sure that we exercise. So these are some of the components, the physical components of health, but there's also a social component to health, right? Are we being healthy socially? And this is a tough one right now because, you know, it, right now it's the era of COVID. And so we're socially distancing. We're not able to get out and be around each other. Social wellness is important. We've got occupational wellness. Are we satisfied in our jobs? Are we feeling fulfilled in our occupations? How about financial wellness, right? Financial wellness is a thing because when we are financially not well, we are aware. We know, okay? Okay. And so when we're financially not aware and financially unwell, we got to get right because finances affect our health overall. Environmental, environmental wellness is a thing. We need to definitely make sure that our environments are, are well, you know, because the food that we eat, the, the, the things that grow from the ground, the water that we drink. I mean, we learned during COVID that the very air we breathe in the east makes its way to the west. And what happens in the north happens in the south. The environment has an effect on our wellness. And then somebody I saw put in the chat, what about mental and spiritual wellness? Well, what about mental and spiritual wellness? When we are unwell mentally, when we are not aligned spiritually, we are not well, you know, I tell my patients, the mind, the body, and the spirit are connected. And I, I do you no service by cutting out your cancer and removing that if I haven't fixed the things that help to contribute to cancer in the first place, right? So we got to get that spirit right. And the last thing is intellectual, right? We can be well intellectually. We can be optimistic. We can be focused on uh, being present. 
while being optimistic about our futures and we can demonstrate some intellectual curiosity about our world and the things around us and that's what I love about the people who are watching this right now they're intellectually curious right mm -hmm. they want their intellect to be well they want all these eight balls or eight dimensions of wellness they want to balance them and they don't want to drop any of them because all of these impact how we feel physically how we uh, interact in our jobs with our families and ultimately how our bodies do as a result of these dimensions of wellness. So, so a couple things, Doc, when I'm talking, I can do go on mute because I think there's a slight echo against people saying there's a, yep, that's great. Um, also, I want everybody to drop in the chat room, how many of these eight dimensions do you feel like you've got a good handle on? So if you feel like, okay, I've got four of the eight, but I need to work on this. I don't need to know what you need to work on unless you want to share that. But put drop it in the chat, in the comments, how many of these eight do you feel like you've got a good handle on? Or you could say, hey, I need to work on three of these dimensions. Oh, two? Okay, I see the questions. The answer's already coming in. So understanding this, in terms of wellness, I'm going to say per personally, I probably got – one and a half. <laughs> I think I'm pretty good socially. Uh, occupationally, I, I take that back. I got two uh, because I love working for Black Doctor. I think I got a good handle on that. Uh, but the rest of it, uh, I got to put up the work in progress side. <laughs> I hear you. Let me jump in and say I probably have maybe three to four on a good day, maybe five. But I don't think I have all of them at the same time. And that's why I said, you know, this is, it's a balancing act. It's not um, just, you know, we just drive and we work and we get there. Even the people who exercise every day religiously, even the people who have a good spiritual regimen still have times when they may not be emotionally or socially well or occupationally well. You know, we found that our jobs are linked to our insurance. And guess what? When, our, when, our, when we lose our jobs and we lose our insurance, there goes our finances and there goes our health, right? Boom. Four of them knocked down. Right, because the interconnected nature, and it was, it's funny because, of course, we know February is Black History Month, uh, and so we've all been kind of celebrating. And one of the things that I've been doing on my personal page is kind of posting some Black history facts on a daily basis. Well, I tried it. I think I've missed a day or two <laughs> along the way. But one of the things I was researching was I was uh, talking about uh, Kemet, and we all know uh, Egypt, and I was going to post a fact about how many of the Greek philosophers, uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, the whatnot, Pythagoras, Egypt, but it was called Kemet uh, uh, back then. And one of the things was to uh, the Egyptian or the, the mystery system, the Kemetic mystery system, uh, was a 40-year journey that encompassed all eight of these things, but it took 40 years to reach that enlightenment, to get all of the knowledge, to connect the spiritual with reason and all these different things. And they're saying that the differences, uh, our education system here in the United States is based on that kind of the Greek uh, system. And what, and the split happened was many of the Greek philosophers did not spend all 40 years getting to that full area era of enlightenment. I think they said Pythagoras spent the most time there and he only spent 23 years, which is still a long time. I can't say only, but 23 years. And so when we're talking about that process of getting those eight balls, it kind of helped me settle down as I realized, okay, if it took 40 years, I'm well, I'm a little bit over 40, but <laughs> I would say that I can't count those childhood years in terms of that, in terms of that spiritual journey. But I, I will say this is that understanding the split was the Greeks relied more on reason and they moved away from that spiritual, whereas people of African descent and from the African diaspora have a strong connection to that spiritual. And that's part of, of who we are. And so when we see that spiritualness, and even throughout enslavement through this country, even throughout everything, the spiritual is what connected us with as a people. And it kept us strong, even through all of the years of turmoil and, and all that happened to us. It's that spiritual peace. And so that that goes back to our early uh, roots in Africa. We cannot, we cannot dissect ourselves from that.
You know, I I love that you said that. And one of the things that I heard you say was that, you know, they spent 40 years. Some of them spent 23 years. But what I think, you know, is important for people to know, number one, I plan on spending a lifetime working (laughs) on this here dimensions of wellness. But just like these things are connected in ways that may be negative, like if your body doesn't feel good, your mental doesn't feel good, and you, you know, but they also, you can accelerate, right? You, one of my, my sorority sisters says you can accelerate your brilliance. You can accelerate your wellness by working on one or two of the things, you know? Well, somebody in the chat said one of their greatest issues is comparison. Well, comparison is the thief of joy. And when you start looking and comparing yourselves to others, comparing to another version of yourself that doesn't exist and you start feeling out of yourself, you know, it it takes away from your wellness. But the thing that people can take home from this today, we're going to give you a couple key take homes. But number one is that when you begin to work on one thing, you begin to simultaneously work on the whole circle. So you getting on that Peloton, you getting out there to that trail, you doing that walk, you getting up, doing your meditation or your prayer in the morning, making that smoothie, you're working on some of these components. And then guess what happens? Then you start to feel better emotionally. Then guess what happens? You start to reach out socially. Then you start to feel more physical. Now you got your exercise team and you guys are encouraging each other, right? And then occupationally, maybe you at your job or in your breaks, on your lunch, you're out, y'all walking, y'all doing the thing. One thing can lead to an entire cycle of wellness. And so the way it works is that when you begin to really live this thing, you won't start looking at, well, which circle did I work on today? Because they're all going to feed off of each other. You know, the, the beautiful thing is like, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. And, and one of the most positive things in sports is it talk about momentum, right? Whenever you start moving in one direction, it starts going. Well, your body creates its own version of momentum, right? In your in your brain, there is a, and doc, you can stop at any point in time I'm wrong. It's called a reticular activating system. It's in your brain. It's also uh, in, in layman's terms, we call it the self-fulfilling prophecy. So what you focus on, what you are concentrating on. If you're concentrating on the negative, negative is going to happen because that's what you're telling your brain is what your natural state should be. So what we got to focus on is we got to trick our brain a little bit, trick ourselves a little bit to build that momentum that says, you know what, today I'm going to be intellectually curious. Today, I'm not going to be emotionally a roller coaster. I'm going to manage my emotions. I'm going to do something physical. And we do that every single day because every time we make a promise to ourselves and we break that promise, our self-esteem is eroded, right? So we have to make sure that we understand what we're doing. We trick our brains into creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. And once you do that, you start building momentum towards successfully juggling these balls. Mm, I, I absolutely love that. And, you know, it ties in to the physical because I think we all have these burning questions that we perseverate on, right? We know something just isn't right, but we we didn't reach out. We're looking at Dr. Google. We're asking friends. We, you know, we're doing a whole lot of things, but we really need to take some time, take some of these concerns to our physician. Like somebody in our chat here said, you know, talk to us about urinary urgency. I feel like I have to go all the time. And is that normal? Well, you you know what? Not exactly. And it really depends on whether or not it's a man or a woman, but the common causes of something like urinary urgency or not just having the feeling to go, but really having to pee every few minutes. Mm. It could be a lot of things, but some of the really important things that you want to be aware of, you want to be aware of diabetes, right? Diabetes can make you feel thirsty all the time, can make you urinate frequently. It can make you feel sluggish and fatigued. That's a thing. Um, interstitial cystitis or inflammation of the bladder, bladder infections, right? Urinary tract infections. Those are things that can make you have to urinate frequently. Um, If it's a man, we're concerned about the prostate. Prostatic enlargement can make you have to urinate urgently, frequently at night. Can't get to sleep because you got to get up and pee and get up and pee. Sometimes just drinking too much liquid and the timing of when we drink our liquids is important. So questions like that, you know, that impacts all your wellness because if you're not sleeping well, if you got to get up and go every few minutes, that impacts your physical wellness, your emotional wellness, you feel groggy, and that sort of chronic fatigue can lead to more chronic illnesses. So if you're somebody who's struggling with that, that's something you definitely want to bring up to your 
doctor so that they can run some tests and rule out some really serious causes of something like urinary urgency and urinary frequency. In building upon that, Doc, should they also be looking at their their urine? Is it is it foamy? Is it uh, the color of their urine? Uh, don't, don't, don't those two things have Absolutely. some implications on on something could be wrong in their systems? Absolutely right. If your urine is tea colored, if it's frothy, if it's foamy, those are real concerns for things like kidney failure, too much protein in your urine. And so if you're if you notice that the color of your urine is changed, or if you're urinating and you know you're passing air and bubbles, things like that, those are definitely things you want to get to the doctor right away for. But you the thing to do, because doctors are going to ask you a couple questions. The first one they're going to say is, Well, how long has this been going on? And then they're going to say, well, do you have the urge to go and you can't go? Or do you have, do you have no urge and you just got to go right then and there and you can't hold it? Or is it some combination of all of it? And does it burn when you go? So you got to take note, right? One of the best things you can be is become an investigator of your health. Because when you put those clues together, that helps your physician, you and your doctor can partner together and figure out what's going on. But you know, sometimes as black folks, we got we got some ways, you know how we do, oh, a little while now. Oh, it's been happening every so often. Those are discrete units of measurement in the community, right? Couple, you know, this and that, here and there. It's been a good minute. It's been a good minute. What is that? So we got to be investigators and get some accurate notes on our health so that we can help our doctors help us. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's it, uh, but that's that's cultural, right? And so when we're talking about engagement into the medical community, that, that there's a two-way street on that. So as as black folks, we have to recognize that we use our colloquialisms. We and we understand, you know, when we say it's been a minute. Yeah, that's a long time, but a doctor might be, might not understand that if he has of a different culture. So we either we have the code switch, which basically, you know, uh, translate it for him, or uh, hopefully we can meet in the middle and have some doctors that have some cultural competence that understand when a black person says it's been a minute, that means it's it's been at least a couple weeks, maybe a month or two. You know what? I think you're right. And, and I think that more importantly than the code switching part, you need to bring your you-ness. You need to be you at the doctor's office. And it's up to your doctor to ask the right questions. If they're not disinterested, if you say something like, eh, been a minute, and they don't ask you anything further, that's a red flag right there. And you need to, pri you need to probe your doctor and say, well, what do you make of that, doc? Right? What do you think of that? Ask some questions and get some some feedback because you know if if your doctor's not asking you questions, then you you want to check in and make sure that they're that they're listening, but that they're also thinking about what this could be and they're meeting you where you are. So yeah, you know it's important to have that information. But if if all you know is it's been a good minute, a little while, a few, a couple, doctors should be asking you questions too. So yeah, so and and, and Doctor making a good point. So I, I'm going to be the patient advocate right right here. So you are your own best health advocate. Okay, so you see your doctor maybe a few times a year, 15, 20 minutes based on your insurance. However, that that's not enough time. You're with yourself all day, every day, 24 hours a day. So the person that knows the most about your health situation is you. You know what you're contributing to it by what you put into your body with what you eat. You know what's coming out of your body when you use it, use the facilities and you know what's going on. So you know how much you exercise, you know how much you don't exercise, you know how much you sleep, you know you gotta get those that deep sleep, that REM sleep to help your body heal and repair. You know that. And if you're not reporting that to your doctor, you can't complain about having poor health outcomes because you get out what you put in. It's very true. I will say that, you know, many of us, we get in that doctor's office and there's so many different things on our mind, right? And the doctor doesn't always leave time for questions because they want you to fit it into a nice little box. What's your chief complaint? So what are you there for? They might listen to your heart and lungs, check a couple things, fix whatever the issue is of the moment, and they're not looking and viewing you as a whole person either. And so it's always good to stop and check in with your doctor and say, okay, so I'm here for this, but 
can we can I ask you a couple questions about this or you know what doc I'm concerned about this because it's always the most important part, point of that office visit is right when that doctor's got their hand on the doorknob and then you remember that one last thing but if you write that thing down if you write those questions down you will have a more productive doctor's appointment and you can get to a lot of the other issues and questions you know and I always ask my patients do you have questions about XYZ? So, for example, COVID vaccines. I work in an area where a lot of people don't want the vaccine and they believe a lot of things about science. And so I go through the whole list. How are we doing with our preventive health? And we run down the list, getting colonoscopy. We got our mammogram. Did, did we get our flu vaccine, our shingles vaccine, our COVID vaccine? And then I pause and then let the patient talk. So your doctor should be letting you talk and say what's on your mind. But that's your stage. That's your moment. If you clam up and you're nervous, or if you forget what you wanted to say, that's where your little cheat sheet comes in. So I want everybody to start writing down in the parking lot the questions you want to ask your doctor or your nurse practitioner, because it is really, really important. And there's nothing worse than getting back to the car and go, oh, I admit that, you know, because now you got to wait, right? Now you got to wait till your next appointment or you try to call and then that, that becomes problematic. So Please, please, please. So there's a couple, there was a question that was asked very early in the program. So I'm gonna put it on screen. And and, and doc, this is an interesting question. So why is it so hard to diagnose pancreatic? First of all, is it? Because I don't know that it is or isn't. And then if it is, why do you think, why is it so hard to diagnose pancreatic cancer? Absolutely. But the first thing I want to address, somebody put in the chat, what if you run out of time, right, in your doctor's office? What if you run out of time? And I would submit to you that there is no such thing in the sense that if you leave that office and you didn't get your question answered, there should be a nurse, there should be a number you can call, there should be a portal, you can go and you can type that in, or you can check us out on Tuesday nights and you can hopefully ask the doc here on what to know with Dr. Mo. But your doctor shouldn't be rushing you through that appointment. And if they got their hand on the doorknob and they're walking out the door, that's that's not good. And you got to pause and you got to stop that doctor and say, I'm not finished yet. I have a few more questions. I just have two more questions. You know, doc, you seem like you're in a hurry today. You doing okay? <laughs> right? Tell that doctor, I see you. I see what's going on because, you know, we're human too. We got a day. Sometimes we're running late. A lot of things going on. But you can meet that person where they are and make them see you too. So running out of time in the office visit really is not a good option because the doctor needs to spend the time that it takes to make sure that you get the care that you need. And if by chance you leave and you didn't get it, one of the things you can do now, thanks to thanks to the coronavirus, is you can set up a telehealth appointment, right? You can go virtual. You can ask that question from the comfort of your home and video chat with most of your doctors now. So you can do a virtual visit and get those questions answered too. Now, to the subject of pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is difficult to diagnose because there aren't a ton of symptoms for it. And by the time there are symptoms, it's usually pretty late in the disease process. So the pancreas helps to make enzymes, which are the worker bees that break down our, our foods that we eat, it break down fats, right? So the pancreas helps us to process our sugars. It produces insulin. It does a lot of things for the body. But when cancerous cells grow there, we don't really recognize it until those cells get so big that it causes blockage of the duct that's, that squirts out the enzymes. So when that duct gets blocked, all that bile starts backing up, and now we end up yellow or jaundiced, right? And this is why they tell you to look at your, your tongue, look at your nails, look at your eyes. In certain people, your skin will begin to look a little bit yellow. But by the time you're jaundiced, things are a little bit further than you would like. Um, if your stools are turning colors, having white stool, your bowel movement should be brown because of the breakdown of the products. But if your bowel movements are white or getting gray and lighter, that's a sign that you need to talk to your doctor. Having pain that can radiate to your back might be a sign more of pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas than pancreatic cancer. But if you got pain right here under your sternum and it just it's like something's burning a hole in you and going all the way to your back, you might have some inflammation of your pancreas and it's something you can talk to your doctors about. And the most important thing is you can talk to your family because pancreatic cancer is rare. So when you find pancreatic cancer in your family, you know how we have our family reunions and we got our shirts and the family tree and Uncle Joe married Aunt Jane and so and so. We start asking questions about the history. 
And if somebody has pancreatic cancer, it's rare and you need to talk to your family about things like genetic testing for mutations because sometimes they can run in families and be passed down generation after generation. Absolutely. So there, there's a couple of questions and to, or some statements that were made by both Jamila and Raymond. So I'm going to combine them into one because they talked about having multiple uh, ailments and conditions at the same time. And Jamila voiced a concern that I've heard before where you know she said with chronic health conditions, uh, she had a ton of specialists. She brought notes and then she just got depressed and stopped. OK, so how do we. How do we as patients that have maybe, you know, because Raymond talked about having uh, high cholesterol and uh, hyperlipidemia and hypertension and, and diabetes and all these things, you got to take all these medications. How do we get through when we have multiple conditions? How do we get through all of that with our mental health intact? We talked about those eight stages of wellness. Some of that is that, is that mental part. How do we get through it uh, effectively and still, you know, forge on each day? Boy, that, that is a really challenging question. And the answer is that it takes, it really does take a village, you know? And so one of the things you got to do is when you're picking your doctor or if you go to your appointment and you're just dissatisfied with the care, they're not addressing as many of those components as they can, right? You, you have the right to really interview your doctor to say, you know, doc, these are the things that I have. What does wellness look like for me? What, what should I be expecting? How can I get to whatever better is? What is better for me, right? I may not get the best, but I want to be on the road to, to wellness. I get that wellness isn't a pull up and park, but what does wellness look like for me? And wait and pause and let that doctor answer. And they may say, okay, wellness for you looks like, let's get your hemoglobin A1C, your marker for diabetes. Let's get that down below 5.7. Let's get your cholesterol to here. Let's do this and let's do that. And here's some of the ways that you can get more bang for your buck by doing X, Y, Z. And chances are they're going to talk to you about a couple things. They're going to talk to you about exercise right? The things that prevent chronic and preventable illnesses also prevent cancer and it's getting up and moving at least 30 minutes a day. I'm not saying you got to be Flojo out there on the track, but I'm saying you get you, seriously, I tell my patients, you know, they got cancer. You can't be, you know, and some of them are really active, but even if you can't, if all you can do is get you two good water bottles and just do arm circles during the commercial breaks, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to work up a sweat. You're going to be out of breath. And you bring those arm, bring those water bottles over. Pretend like you're bench pressing, right? With those water bottles for your three minute commercial break and you won't make it through three minutes. And then mm -hmm. the next commercial break, I want you doing leg kicks, scissor kicks, right? You're not going to make it through three minutes of scissor kicks. You're going to be out of breath. You're going to be mad at Dr. Gary. And if you do that for an hour of TV a night, Right? One hour TV and exercise just during the commercials and build up your endurance to get through the whole commercial break. 20 minutes of exercise without leaving your couch. 20 to 25 mm -hmm. minutes. And so your doctor should be talking to you about different aspects of wellness and how to combine them. Your doctor should be connecting you to resources like a mental health professional, right? A nutritionist. Because many clinics now, many physicians' practices have nutritionists that are aligned with them in their health systems. If not, you need to start looking for one. A naturopathic physician is another member of the team that you can consider. And it's not either or. It's not either I eat sea moss and I never see a doctor or, you know, I'm taking, you know, five antihypertensives and, and, and a statin. It's, it's everything. All of it works together. So finding the right team is one of the most important things that you can do if you have chronic illnesses and mental health issues all together because they feed on each other. But as you start working on one, just like that circle of wellness, start working on one, you'll be working on the others as well, building your wellness. So get you a good team. Absolutely. If you're just joining us, you are watching the inaugural show of What to Know with Dr. Mo, where we're answering your health questions. So that's what this show is all about. So if you have a question, if you just joined us, if you've got a health related question, drop it in the comments and we will ask it. We will answer it live here on the show. Thank you, Raymond, for, for that. Uh, we plan to be here and we're going to do we're going to really what. Our goal for this whole show is, is to really answer those questions. We do a good job of providing culturally relevant information at blackdoctor.org. But a lot of times, sometimes we pick the topics, right? Tonight, this show is all about you. 
We have some things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about heart health in a little bit because this is Heart Awareness Month. And so our heart is so connected to everything that we do. Um, so tonight we are going to talk a little bit about heart health, heart health awareness, if I can get it out of my mouth. And we're going to talk about, and we've talked about the, the eight stages of wellness. However, we're answering your questions. We're going, so if you have some questions, health related, throw us off track, ask us. So we talked about pancreatic cancer diagnosis. We've talked about uh, multiple illnesses. And I, I think ultimately what, what Dr. Mo is saying is absolutely right. It's not an either or, it's a yes and. So yes, go see your doctor. Yes, follow your treatment plan and eat right and exercise and, you know, work on all of those other eight stages because they all work in connection. It's not just either or, it's a yes and. I absolutely love that. My secondary goal for this show, I'll tell you, is that I want you to learn how to ask questions. Learn how, find your voice, right? Learn how to get the, the questions that give you the answers that you need to live a healthy life because sometimes we don't ask because we're, 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 we don't feel empowered to ask. And so this show is hopefully going to help you feel empowered to start asking questions, right? And if you don't quite know how to phrase a question, we'll help you. If you know, you're not sure if it's a good question, you know, we'll read it anonymously. But if you don't ask, you know, the, the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know. And so here we are. We're going to put it in front of your eyes so your mind can see it, so that you can ask your doctor, so you can ask your family, so you can start having these conversations around the kitchen table. We want you to feel empowered from this show. So here we are. What to know from Dr. Mo. And, you know, nothing is taboo. Everything is on the table. And if we don't know it, we're going to find somebody who does. So, you know, even for me, right, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to assume I know it all either, but we're going to do the best that we can to get your questions answered. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is this is a spot. This is this is a thing. And so and we're going to talk to you like family because we are all family here. Right. So this is we're going to take all the pretext down and we're going to really get to where the rubber meets the road. As my old football coach used to say, we're going to get to where the rubber meets the road and we're going to talk about those things that we need to talk about. So a ask your questions, please, please, please make sure. So, Doc, I know it's Heart Health Awareness Month or Heart Health Month. Um what do people know, especially black folks? Because we understand, I don't think black people really realize how much, how many heart conditions and how many other conditions affect the heart, like hypertension, like high cholesterol, like diabetes, all of these, these conditions that we know about because they disproportionately impact our community, but they all point back to impacting that organ that keeps that blood pumping through our bodies, and that's the heart. So let's talk about heart health, and what would you like our audience to know tonight about heart health? And if y'all have any questions, please drop it in the, in the comments. So I want people to know, one, how important the heart is, right? Everybody knows that the heart is the pump that pumps the blood. It receives the blood from the lungs. It receives it with oxygen and it pumps it out to the rest of the body, right? It's the ticker. It's, it's our motor. Our hearts are so important, and we tend to think of our hearts as being separate from our blood pressure, right? People say, oh, I got high blood pressure, but they don't really think that that, you know, could lead to heart disease, right? Oh, I got cholesterol. Oh, I got sugar. I got diabetes, but they think it's something totally different. Diabetes is pancreas, right? That don't have nothing to do with the heart, and the answer is that there's three main causes. There's lots of causes, but three main chronic preventable causes of heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol and smoking, right? And why is that? So your blood pressure is how the blood pumps through the body. What's the pressure or the rate and the force that that heart is working? And when you have um, a high salt diet, when you have high blood pressure, your heart's working overtime. Right. So now, just like if you pump iron all the time, your muscle gets big. Right. We're building muscle. Well, guess what? The heart builds muscle, too. And we don't want the heart to build too much muscle. That's called hypertrophy. Right. If your heart is too muscular, that means it doesn't stretch to fill to get all that good blood that it needs to squeeze it out. It's too swollen. So your heart's all swollen because your blood pressure is too high, and now your heart's not pumping enough blood to the places it needs to go, like the brain, like the kidneys, like your toes, right? And so high blood pressure, when you can get your blood pressure under control, and they call it the silent killer, right? Mm -hmm. Hypertension is the silent killer because it's attacking your kidneys, it's attacking your heart, it's attacking your blood vessels, all these things, and you don't even know it. Cholesterol. Well, what is cholesterol? 
is too much fat. Too much fat in the blood. And guess where it goes? It goes to the lining of your blood vessels and it sticks there like sludge and sewage in the pipes. When you got too much sewage in your pipes or too much sludge in your pipes, guess what happens, right? The flow gets real slow. That Exactly, that lumen, that diameter decreases. And you know, rotor rooter down your drain is a lot easier than rotor rooter in your heart. That rotor rooter in your blood vessels. <laughs> And I'm not saying people should take roto rooter. Let me let me clarify that and put a disclaimer. But it's a lot harder to do, right? You can snake your drains, but if we gotta snake your heart, that's a lot harder to do. Yeah. And so cholesterol blocking up your arteries can contribute to heart disease. Smoking. How does smoking? How does that affect your heart? Right? That's your lungs. That's lung cancer. Smoking causes inflammation right? Inflammation, it damages the lining of your blood vessels. It damages the heart because smoking is not just about the nicotine and the tobacco. It's about a lot of other things that go into those cigarettes, a lot of inflammatory agents that impact the heart as well. So, and diabetes, same thing. Diabetes causes inflammation around the heart, in the blood vessels, in the little tiny vessels. And so diabetes too is a risk factor for heart disease and they're all connected. So if you can start getting your diabetes under control, if you can start getting your hypertension under control, if you can stop smoking, you're going to be improving the quality of your heart. And guess what? The cancer connection, because I got to go there while we're talking about it, because everything, I have a theory that all roads lead to cancer and not in a good way, but hopefully we can reverse it in a good way. But all roads, all this stuff leads to cancer because over 80% of our chronic and preventable illnesses, right, contribute to cancer. And when we look at the link between heart disease, chronic illnesses, and cancer, they study more than 12,000 patients over 15 years. And the people who had these chronic illnesses, high blood pressure, heart disease, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, were three times more likely to be diagnosed with cancer than people who didn't. Right. So it's not just your lungs, it's not just your sugar, it's not just your high blood pressure. We're talking about cancer now too. If you want to save a limb, because people that are diabetics, it, it can, there's, and, and black people tend to have more uh, amputations as a result of diabetes than any other uh, group. There's also other illnesses that can come, ailments that can come. You can have stroke, and that's all related to heart disease. Uh, and so... Just take care of your heart. <laughs> and your blood. You know, black folks tend to be anemic. And we'd like to say, oh, we're anemic. We walk around crunching on ice. And, you know, sometimes we'll get some black strap molasses. Or, you know, like we, we have some 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 things that cause us as a people to to be anemic. But when you don't have enough blood, guess what the heart does? It's working harder because it doesn't have enough blood to get every place. So if your volume, if your hemoglobin, as we call it, if your hemoglobin or your amount of red blood cells is low, then the heart's going to be working harder also. And your blood pressure goes up and up and up. And that can lead to a stroke or a blockage, an occlusion, a shutdown of the arteries in your brain. And so, too, if you got anemia, you all just got a little, you know, my blood's a little low. I'm going to eat me. I'm going to eat a steak. You got to take care of it. You got to maintain and really get those levels up, you know, and, and, and follow up with that thing because it's really, really important. Heavy menstrual cycles, people who are, you know, have uh, low iron levels, all that stuff impacts the heart, impacts the brain, impacts the kidneys, impacts your limbs. Got to get blood to everywhere so that those limbs can live. There were a couple of questions that came through from our from people that are watching us on YouTube. So thank you, Catherine, for these couple of questions. So first question is, how often should we check for moles regarding potential skin cancer? I love that question. And the short answer is that you should consider checking for moles, one, as often as you check your skin, right? And so there's some things, some characteristics of moles that are... Um, that are more suspicious than others, but you really should see a dermatologist at least once a year. If you are higher risk, if you are very fair skin, if you got family history of skin cancer, you might need to see a dermatologist twice a year. And yes, black folks need to go see the dermatologist. Places that we should check, especially hands, the palms, the soles of our feet. I don't know if you know, but um, uh, what's, what's my man, Bob Marley, died of melanoma. 
of his toe. He needed to have his foot amputated and it spread. Metastatic melanoma because it starts underneath the nails, soles of the feet, palms of the hands. So we should be checking ourselves every day. You know, learn, learn your body. But there's places that you can't see like your back and your scalp that a dermatologist can check out. So at least once a year to see the dermatologist. I know they say black don't crack, but it does get cancer. So get it together and go see a dermatologist and quit playing. All right. So Katha had another question and she said, do vitamins really work? Why do we need them? And I think she's, she's, she's talking, talking about, about supplements because all foods have vitamins. So she's talking about do supplements work and why do we need supplements? So the short answer for do vitamins work is yes. But the longer answer is it's complicated because we get the most vitamins from the food that we eat. And the reason why is because our foods work synergistically together, right? So eating broccoli mixed with eating mustard greens, work with eating black pepper, activate certain agents, right? You get more vitamin C from, uh, from eating an orange than you do maybe from sometimes your supplements. And what we do sometimes is we end up replacing our diet with really expensive supplements supplements and all you're going to get is really expensive urine. The body can only absorb from a vitamin about 30 to up to maybe 50 percent of what's in that capsule. So that means you got to not only consider taking your supplement. And I'm a fan. I take a vitamin D supplement, right? D3. Um, I'm taking um, uh, another, I'm taking zinc supplement, right? Um, I'm taking uh, an immune supplement. And, and so I'm making sure that I take those things. But one, I also take them with food. Two, I'm looking to get most of my vitamin C, most of my magnesium from the food that I eat. And we don't get enough of those nutrients. So, you know, it's a good time for you to start looking at how you're incorporating fruits and vegetables into your diet because your vegetables have those trace minerals, the zinc, the selenium, the chromium, all that stuff that helps wound healing and helps the processes in the body, the currency exchanges. So, you know, yes, supplements do work, but they don't work in a vacuum. And we really want to get more of it from your diet than from a pill. I, I'm about to start shouting up in here because you are really preaching to it. And so one of the things, uh, so we do a show on Thursday evenings called Veganish, and it talks about how to live a more, eat a more plant-based diet. And so if you need some help in determining how to eat a more plant-based diet, I encourage you to watch that program. It's also, we've got a playlist on our YouTube channel. You can watch past programs. Uh, this past couple of shows where we did, um, we're talking about the, the, the diets, the fad diets that are out there, the keto diets and whatever, and are they good or are they not? And so I encourage you to watch that program. Also understand how grocery stores are laid out and it took, you know, you have to shop the perimeter because you notice all the fresh fruits and vegetables and all the, the, even if you eat meat, it's all around the outside. That's where less of the sugar is. Eat the rainbow. That's something that you can think. Program your mind to say, eat the rainbow. So don't just go there and eat the leafy greens because that has certain types of vitamins in it. But eat the reds, eat the purples, eat the yellows, eat the oranges, eat all everything in between. Because the more plants, the more stuff that grew out of the ground, fruits and vegetables that you can get into your diet, the cleaner you will be. Fiber. We talked we talked about cholesterol a little bit. Fiber is a good agent to help clear out those arteries as they start getting clogged up, omega-3, fatty acids. So those fish, like, you know, you know, black folks, we like some salmon. Okay. All right. You know, we like our salmon. <laughs> okay. All right. But not the croquettes because y'all put too much stuff in when you eat the croquettes. Eat some fresh salmon. <laughs> eat some salmon. Get a lot of omega-3 fatty acids into your life to make sure that you're getting the healthy food, food nutrients into your body. You ain't right, but you ain't wrong for that one because it is very, very true. And eat the fish skin. You know, I put mine in the oven and I put it in the broiler. I make nice crispy, you know, crispy salmon skin, right? You can season it, crisp it up, and it is a great source of those omega fatty acids. And what they do, they are anti-inflammatory, right? Meaning they bring the inflammation down, meaning they also thin the blood. And so this is a good time to talk about anti-inflammatory foods mm -hmm. and anti-inflammatory supplements, turmeric, ginger, garlic, 
garlic, uh, ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, those neuro supplements, anything that says anti-inflammatory and probably anti-cancer, some of the um, the mycolic, some of the mushrooms, they are also blood thinners. So you want to be really careful if you are taking blood thinners, if you have bleeding disorders, that you know when you're taking anti-inflammatory supplements, that you make sure that you talk about that with your doctor. Absolutely. So I'm going to say just as a, as a blanket, everything that we're talking about tonight, all anything is not considered medical advice. It is just we're giving you some information. Everything we talk about should be discussed with your primary care physician, right? Because your body is different and you don't know what's going on. So we can't just say what well, Dr. Mo said. No, Dr. Mo is talking in general. She's not talking about you specifically. You need to have that conversation with your doctor to ensure that everything that we're saying tonight can be applicable to you and your diet. That's number one. Um, there was a quick question from Marlene here. She wanted to know, what's the difference between vitamin D2 and D3? If we know that. We do. It's a great question. Vitamin D2. Uh, so vitamin D exists in two main forms. The first one is D2, which is ergocalciferol. Vitamin D3 is cholecalciferol. Vitamin D3 tends to be more uh, bioavailable, more active, more effective. And so, and they come from different places. So the source of vitamin D2 comes from um, uh, animal products. Uh, it can come from fortified foods, from mushrooms, from dietary supplements. So your D2 is coming from the um, from your the foods, right, that are fortified with vitamin D. But your D3 is better. That's coming from your fish oil. It's coming from liver, coming from egg yolk, coming from butter, coming from dietary supplements. And absolutely right, Raymond, the best source of vitamin D is, guess what, good old-fashioned sunshine. And we are not getting enough of that sitting underneath these ring lights and fluorescent lights, and, you know, indoors, right, sheltering at home. We're not getting enough vitamin D in our diet. So make sure that if you can, it's getting lighter. It's staying lighter longer. Get outside, even for a few minutes. Get yourself some sunshine. Get some foods that are fortified with vitamin D because it certainly helps your immune system and helps you to prevent chronic illnesses. It is a wonderful, wonderful vitamin supplement to consider if you're going to take a supplement um, and you want to talk with your doctor about the dose that's right for you. But I would say no more than um, really, oh boy, no more than 5,000 units daily. You want to be careful about taking too much vitamin D because, you know, every drug is a poison, even water. You drink too much water, your sodium levels can go low and you could die. And so you got to consider that just because it's, you know, from the earth, it's a good time to talk about that. Just because it's an herbal supplement, just because it's natural, just because it's from the earth doesn't mean it doesn't have toxicities because many herbal supplements can impact the liver. So as you go on your health journey, make sure you talk about it, research it, ask us about it and get some information on how this could impact your wellness as a whole. Man, 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 it's, it's it's so much there, so much there. So absolutely. And just as a side note, we know that uh, black and brown people typically have lower levels of vitamin D. And so therefore it's important. So go on, get your raw airs, put that on, pl play a song. Everybody loves the sunshine and go sit outside in the sunshine. Okay. Get you some sunshine, get your D3 from the sunlight. Also, it is, it's, it's very important understanding that people that had COVID, so we're talking, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, a, a great portion of the people, especially black and brown people that died were low in vitamin D. And so that's when we're talking about being our immune system. Vitamin D has a, has a, plays an important role in our immune system. And so we have to make sure that we are, that our levels are, are, are straight. So um, you can't get it from milks, but hey, if you can go sit outside, sit outside. It's fine. Or walk. How about that? You can you can go buy two and one, two and one. Walk outside in the sunshine, and then you're getting your vitamin D three from the sun, and you're getting your movement all in one. It's true, especially, you know, many of us tend to be lactose intolerant. We um, are not huge milk drinkers, so you got to make sure that you get your calcium and your vitamin D, and you need to take those things together. They work synergistically. So calcium and vitamin D, magnesium as well, all three of those work together. So if you got low magnesium, your calcium levels aren't going to go up. Your vitamin D levels are going to are going to be challenged. So make sure that you look for foods that are high in magnesium, calcium, vitamin D. Wow, this is this is wonderful. I'm glad I'm glad you wanted to do this, Doctor Mo. I am really excited about this program. Again, this is as we're wrapping up our hour. This has been the fun hour here, but we're watching what to Mo, what to know from Doctor Mo, and we we started this program kind of talking about uh, the eight dimensions of wellness. I'm gonna put the put it back up just in case uh, you need to see that again. So eight dimensions of wellness and. 
we really share, okay, we're not working on all these eight dimensions, but if we can, if we can build that momentum, if we can trick our brain with that reticular activating system, if we can build a self-fulfilling prophecy, we can keep all those eight balls in the air and move into a better, healthier life. We also answered a lot of your questions. That's the... That's the theme of this show. We're answering your questions, health related questions tonight. So you make sure you put those in the comment section. And we talked because it's Heart Health Awareness Month. We did a low black history. I talked about the comedic, comedic mystery system. And then we also talked about heart health. So we packed it all in at one show. So as we're wrapping up here, getting close. So if you, you got a few more minutes to ask your, your questions, uh, Dr. Mo, is there anything else that you'd like for people to know about the cancer connection or anything as we're getting close to the end of our? hour absolutely i want to address this one question is there a way to boost your calcium levels without taking calcium and the answer is yes yes and absolutely yes you want to look for foods that are rich in calcium like you know this is the thing and we have known this as um as a people right food is medicine food can be medicine it's not the sum total of our medicine and you know we don't sit and eat food all day long to get the amount of nutrition and medicine that we need for the ways that our bodies are depleted and this is where we can get a little confused we mistake the maintenance for the cure right we Whoa. started yep <laughs> You said a word right there. You said a word. I'm sorry. I had to shout out right quick. It, it's, it's true. We, we mistake the maintenance for the cure, right? Our food, our nutrition is maintenance, right? And we're starting from behind. We already haven't been sleeping. We already, you know, borderline on the exercise. Guilty party right here. Dry cleaning, hanging on the Peloton, right? We already, you know, not eating as much or as often as we should. And we kind of pick up what we can, where we can. We already, we get stressed out. We, you know, life is really real. And so when you go on this wellness journey, you got to consider that your body may already be starting from behind. And so in order to get the amount of, you know, antioxidants that you need, I especially talking to cancer patients, right? Because antioxidants are the Pac-Man that chomp away at damaged cells. And if you don't get anything out of today, it's that damaged cells happen as a result of inflammation and chronic illnesses. So today we've been talking about that. Diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, because it's Heart Healthy Month and Black History Month this year has been designated as Black Health Awareness Month. Black Health and, well and Wellness Month. Let me say that right. Black Health and Awareness Month. Black Health and Wellness so I'm saying that to say that one of the best things you can do is fortify your diet with antioxidants, okay, because they get rid of the damaged cells in your blood vessels, in your bloodstream, in your, you know, after surgery, after chemo, after radiation, especially if you have cancer. They, they are supplements and foods that you want to get into your body. Calcium. You can get your calcium from cheese, from yogurt, from milk, from sardines, from green leafy vegetables like spinach, kale, turnips, collard greens, right? You can get it from fortified foods like your oat bran, raisin bran, cornflakes. They're fortified with calcium also. And that can help your bowels to move because your gut is very important. Moving your bowels is not just good for colon health. It decreases the amount of inflammation in your body. So the take home message today is that your body is connected from your head to your toes, from your heart to your lungs, to your liver, to your colon, right? It's all connected. And the things that you do to promote wellness, to get rid of inflammation in one area are going to help you get rid of inflammation in another area. Because if you stop smoking, guess what? The inflammation in your lungs goes down. The inflammation in your pancreas goes down. The inflammation in your heart, in your blood vessels, in your brain. I could go on. And so the answer is do something. Do something is going to affect everything in that wellness circle. And it's going to also decrease your risk for cancer because there's the cancer connection. Inflammation gets into your body from diseases, from backed up bowels that haven't been moving and it gets into your bloodstream. That bacteria goes somewhere and it finds little places to nest and create little gardens of badness where cancer cells can grow and can thrive. That's the cancer connection. It's inflammation. So if you can get the inflammation down in your organs and your systems, you will reduce your risk for cancer. 
You will feel better physically. You will feel better mentally, spiritually, emotionally. You're going to be getting social because your body going to be right and tight, right? You're going to get them finances in order so you can go on that vacation. So you can, you know, when outside really opens back up, people want to be out, right? So we're going to get everything. All those components of wellness are going to fall into place just by you taking one or two steps. You don't have to do it all. Just one or two steps. I'm going to get this last question in from Pam. If a man is having problems with prostate cancer, does it, uh, with his prostate, does that mean he has cancer? Not necessarily. So we've had uh, Dr. Mac Roach. He's one of he's a prostate um, surgeon. We've had him on multiple times here, and so it does not necessarily. So he's got to get that that PSA was a, a prostate uh, specific <laughs> antigen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, okay, that's what the PSA test for. So you have to get that number, right? Get that number, and it's over a certain level. I believe it's over four. You got to be under four. Uh, and that you're in good shape. But if you're over four, you might want to get uh, a biopsy. Now, between the biopsy, and this is what, and this is where a lot of black men get caught, is that biopsy is not a pleasant thing, and it takes snapshots of the prostate. What you can ask for is to have an ultrasound done before the biopsy, and the ultrasound will give you a full 360 picture of the prostate, and that can see if there's any lumps or bumps on the entire prostate because of Biopsy only takes bits and pieces. So, Doc, correct me if I'm wrong. You are not wrong. You are absolutely spot on. And I want to drive the point home that we've been talking about the whole show. Guess what the number one cause of an elevated PSA is? Inflammation of the prostate, right? Inflammation. Benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostatitis, which is itis. Anything itis means inflammation. So if your prostate is inflamed, that is going to contribute to an elevated PSA as well. And so there's things that you can do. You know, you really want to look at ways to decrease prostate inflammation, um, taking warm baths, right? Um, making sure that you... Um, um, use it or lose it. And and I say that, you know, this is an open forum where we can talk like family, but ejaculations will help you to decrease inflammation within your prostate, right? Having an anti-inflammatory diet can help you to decrease inflammation in your prostate as well. So you, there's some things that you want to do for prostate health, and we can talk more about that uh, for sure. But, you know, again, the key driver is inflammation, and guess what? All roads end up leading to that cancer connection. So just because you have inflammation of your prostate does not mean you have cancer, um, but it's on the road to, to developing a cancer potentially. So you want to develop an intervention and get really um, serious about it before prostate cancer because it is one of the highest killers of black men. The, you know, When we look at the cancers that black men get and that we die from, prostate cancer is up there. And it's and very it's preventable. preventable. Very much so. Yeah. So I, I've had so much fun tonight. If we we could go on, on and on because we're getting some great questions. We had some so much fun. So I'm looking forward to this. So check us back. I, I think in, in two weeks, we're going to be back here in two weeks. Same show. What to know, Dr. Mo, answering your health-related questions. Keep an eye out on our blackdoctor.org Facebook page. I'm going to be putting some posts in there to get some questions ahead of time. So if you see that post, make sure you drop your questions because we can collect those ahead of time and have them ready to go when we do our next show. So we'll see y'all in two weeks. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been so much fun. It's the easiest hour of my day. Thank you, Dr. Bo. Can't wait till next time. This has been a joy. You can follow me on all social media outlets at Dr. Monique Gary, D-R Monique Gary, G-A-R-Y, like Gary, Indiana. Um, And I'll take your questions there as well. Please share this broadcast with family, with friends, because we're going to be responding in the chat and answering even more of the questions that we didn't get to. There were some good ones about family history. Yes, you should get hereditary cancer testing. Do not take no for an answer. If you're watching and you ask that question, you know, go back and take a look at it. Talk to your doctor about it. We're going to talk about that more. But We're here for you to learn how to ask the questions, listen for the answers, and get in the know with Dr. Mo. (laughs) She's good, y'all. I love it.